Good morning, everybody. Today we will start with general information about X-rays. This is the first lecture of X-ray technologies. And within that lecture, I will explain the importance of X-rays and historical important steps in X-ray science and technology. And I will also mention the very broad applications of X-rays in our daily life and I will finish with the content of lecture during that semester. First of all, let me introduce you useful books. The first one is X-ray Science and Technology, written by Michette and Buckley. This is very nice book, especially for synchrotron light sources, especially for the next chapter, Production of X-rays. This book will be very, very helpful. In our university library, you can find the hard copy of that book. In addition to that, there is another book with the name of Elements of X-ray Diffraction, written by Kaliti and Stock. This book mainly concentrates on X-ray diffraction. For us, for the chapter of X-ray diffraction, this book can be very, very useful. And the next one is Radiation Detection and Measurement, written by Glenn F. Knoll. This book dedicated to the detectors, radiation detectors, mainly for nuclear experiments detectors, but the mechanism of many detectors are same. So this book can also be very, very useful for you. In addition, there is another book, you already know this one, Introduction to Associate Physics, written by Charles Kittel, especially the Miller indices, crystal structures, and reciprocal lattice. All these things are explained very well in that book, so if you have it, it will be very helpful for you. But unfortunately, there is no a single book completely covers the whole topic of course. So course has very broad content and unfortunately I cannot provide or advise a single book for this lecture. Do you have any question related to the books and references? Then let's start with the discovery of X-rays. As you know, X-rays were discovered by Wilhelm Konrad Röntgen in Germany, German physicist in 1895. In that time, Röntgen was working in the University of Würzburg in Germany. X means unknown, okay? Unknown, in that time, this type of radiation was not known. So the name is X-rays. And later on, Röntgen awarded by Nobel Prize in Physics in 1901. And just look at the dates. Just six years after his discovery, he got the Nobel Prize. So this Nobel Prize is the first in the world. The first Nobel Prize went to the physics and went to the Röntgen due to his discovery of X-rays. This Nobel Prize was very fast, just six years after his discovery. Here you see a hand and these are the bones of the fingers, right? And here you see a ring and here you see a handwritten note, Hand mit Ringen. This is in German, it means hand with ring. This is the hand of Wilhelm Röntgen's wife, so this was taken in 1895 by Röntgen. And then Röntgen presented this to Professor Zender. Here you can see the name of Professor Zender. Here you can see, I think, the stamp of the University of Würzburg, where in that time Wilhelm Röntgen was working. Now let's have a look. Important historical steps in X-rays in X-ray science and also for X-ray industry, X-ray applications. So you will see how these important steps change our life. In 1895, in November, Röntgen discovered X-rays and got the Nobel Prize. And let me also give you some important information here that you will see many Nobel Prizes in these important steps in X-rays. So who did touch X-rays 
at the beginning of 20th century awarded by Nobel Prize. So you can understand how X-rays are powerful to investigate the materials. So in 1896, in January, a few months after first medical application of X-rays, you cannot see such a fast discovery in the world. You can convert it to the applications, daily applications. For this reason, X-rays are unique in that type of fast application in daily life. So this was the first medical application. And then in the same year, in 1896, Edison and Stevens discovered independently the harmful effects of X-rays. So today we know that X-rays are dangerous because they are ionizing radiation. But in that time, it was not known. And Edison and Stevens discovered these harmful effects. So March and April. So you see how it was spreading very, very fast. So now, very important step. In 1897, just two years after discovery of X-rays, in Istanbul, in Ottoman Turkey in that time, X-rays used to capture of a bullet in the body of a wounded soldier. So this was the first military application in the world, and it is published in European Journal of Radiology in 2005. I will go into detail a little bit. This is the picture of this wounded soldier. Here you can see uh, the arm of the soldier. Here there is a Röntgen film, and here there is a Röntgen apparatus, X-ray tube. Okay, of course, there is no radiation shielding. As I told you, the harmful effects of X-rays were discovered by Edison and Stevens just one year after discovery of X-rays, but probably people did not know very well the harmful effects of the X-rays. So this soldier wounded in Turkish Greek war in 1896 or 1897, and then came to the Istanbul, Yildiz military hospital. And within that hospital, Esat Feizi Efendi, he was an intern doctor, got his Röntgen images, okay, in order to capture of the bullet in the body of this wounded soldier. And this was the first in the world. This picture, First of all, published in Istanbul at Serveti Funun Journal. This was the weekly popular journal in that time and published on 10th of June in 1897. And later on, Esat Feizi published that study in Nevsal Afiyet. This was medical journal in that time in 1899. So from that information, you can understand that how the X-rays widely used just after its discovery. I mean, if you carefully read that paper published in European Journal of Radiology, you will see that Esat Feizi Efendi started to use X-rays in Istanbul in 1896, just before that date. So in 1895, X-rays were discovered in Germany, and in 1896, X-rays were started to be used in Istanbul. So it is amazing how it was widely used just in a short time. Let me continue. In 1909, Barkla discovered characteristic radiation of the elements. So what is the meaning of that? This is very, very important discovery in science. So it affected everything in our life. So each element, each atom has its own characteristic radiation, but in that time it was not known. So Barkla discovered this one and then awarded by Nobel Prize in 1917. So later on I will talk about what is the characteristic radiation. Another important discovery done by von Lau he discovered the diffraction of X-rays by crystals. Until that time, it was not known that X-rays can be diffracted from the crystals. Von Lau had two proposals, and then he stated that if these proposals are correct, X-rays can be diffracted from the crystals, 
and later on this proposal is corrected by experiments. Von Lau was also awarded by Nobel Prize in 1914 due to that discovery. So what is the importance of this discovery? Today, we know the crystal structure of the materials very well and we can investigate them. But in that date, it was not known. So with that discovery, we can understand the crystal structure of the materials and we can develop, we can produce very nice technologies with that information. Another diffraction related study done by William Breck and William Lawrence Breck, as much as I remember father and son, and they analyzed crystal structure by means of x-rays. And this was the first crystal structure analysis in the world. And they developed a very simple model to study crystal structures, which is given by n lambda is equal to 2d sinus theta. In the x-ray diffraction part, I will concentrate on this one. For this reason, I will not go into detail. So they were awarded also by Nobel Prize in 1915. So you can see who did touch x-rays and then awarded by Nobel Prize, more or less. Another important step in 1914, first systematic works with characteristic x-rays by Henry Moseley. Here I mentioned the discovery of characteristic x-rays, characteristic radiation in 1909 by Barclay and Henry Moseley did systematic works with characteristic x-rays. And then with the help of his studies, periodic table is corrected. He did marvelous job in physics, but he died in 1915. I think in that time he was 27 years old. He died in Çanakkale, in Gallipoli, okay, in Ottoman Turkey in that time, because he came to Gallipoli to fight against Ottoman Turkey in that time, and then he died there. He was volunteered, I think. So. There are also many other important steps and many other Nobel Prizes in physics, but I will not go into detail. If you are interested, you can find them in internet. Let me also continue with the another important step in 1947. This was the first observation of synchrotron radiation. This was the experimental result. So what is synchrotron radiation? I will go into detail in next week, okay? So we will discuss the production of X-rays. There are many methods to produce X-rays. For example, X-ray tubes, rotating on a tube, cyclotron, synchrotron, free electron lasers. There are many methods. Let me just tell you that the synchrotron radiation is much more bright compared to the conventional X-ray tubes. And you can carry out your experiments very fast and you can get more information with synchrotron radiation. And this is very, very useful. I will go into detail next week. So this was the experimental observation of the synchrotron radiation in 1947. And actually, theoretically, it is predicted in 1944 by Ukrainian Dmitry Ivanenko and Russian Isaac Pomeranchuk. So they published their theoretical prediction in Physical Review Journal. And in 1949, X-ray detectors started to be used in astronomy to get the X-rays coming from other planets and stars and from space, okay? Since Earth's atmosphere absorbs the X-rays coming from the space, you have to put that X-ray detectors, X-ray collecting detectors to the space. So this was done for the first time by using rocket flights. And it was done in New Mexico with a V2 rocket. So you can get information about a V2 rocket and you can also read about that story in internet. You can find lots of information. Of course, X-ray astronomy is also fundamental science, but it provides many technological improvements. We will discuss later on. Another important historical step was the development of high-resolution electron spectroscopy. He used X-rays in order to get high-resolution electron spectroscopy. 
It was done by Kai Zikban. Of course, he was also awarded by Nobel Prize in Physics in 1981. So he did these things in 1950s, but got the Nobel Prize just 30 years after his developments. Here you will see another important step, the development of computer-assisted tomography, or you can say computer tomography. Today in the hospitals, we use that technology. Okay, you can get very nice two-dimensional pictures of the body, okay, by using the X-rays, X-ray computer tomography, and they awarded by Nobel Prize in physiology or medicine for 1979, Alan McCormack and Godfrey Hansfield. So this is very, very important step also in, in science and affected our daily life for medical applications. And not only for medical applications, this computer tomography is also used in industry for quality check purposes. I will talk about this during the last lecture of this semester. Okay, do you have any question until that point? Actually, I did not mention all the important steps in the X-ray history. There are also many other important developments do you have any question here? Then let me continue with the electromagnetic spectrum. So what is electromagnetic spectrum? Electromagnetic spectrum means many applications in our life. So we have radars, mobile phones, microwave ovens, and thermometers, infrared cameras, normal lights, visible light, and UV lights for many applications, X-rays for Röntgen imaging, computer tomography, and also gamma rays for cancer treatment, okay? So within all these methods, we use electromagnetic radiation, we use light, okay? So what is electromagnetic spectrum? Electromagnetic spectrum explains this wide wavelength range of electromagnetic radiation. So here you see the wavelengths in meter, okay? And wavelengths are increasing, okay, in this direction. And here you see frequencies in Hertz in that region. And of course, this is also energy, okay? If frequency increases, energy also increases. Wavelength increases and energy decreases. Energy increases, wavelength decreases, vice versa. Here, the relation, this is the energy of the photon, energy of the electromagnetic radiation. This is the HC, Planck constant, velocity of light, and this is the wavelength of the light. So if you have a higher wavelength, then you have lower energy. Here, there is also a relation between wavelength and frequency, okay? They are inversely proportional to each other. So what we have here, let me start from the radio waves, TV, and also radar waves. So we have wavelengths in meters for long range interaction, okay? So military radars, civil radars, and also telecommunication applications, connections with mobile phones, and also Bluetooth, we can say, we can say wireless connection, all this technology is based on uh, the electromagnetic radiation in this range. And if you come to the microwave ovens, we have this range. So what we have here, wavelength is around, let's say 10 to minus one, 10 to minus three meter. And if you come to the infrared region, we are using non-contact thermometers in that region because they detect the temperature of the body. And we are using infrared radiation from the human, from the animals, from the military vehicles. So you can use infrared radiation to produce night vision for infrared cameras. Here we have very, very small region, which is called visible light because we can only see by eye this region. So this region is more or less from infrared to the UV region, from red to blue, from 700 nanometer to 400 nanometer, we can see by eye. 
And then here we have UV region. This is money check instruments. And there are also many other instruments. For example, UV lithography is very famous one in production of integrated circuits, PCB printing, all the things done by UV light. And X-rays are located. We are dealing with X-rays. So they have very broad wavelengths and energy, you see. And here we have gamma rays. This is the electromagnetic spectrum. And what about the X-ray energies? If you look at the wavelength here, this is somehow rough representation of the wavelength range. Usually wavelengths of X-rays are between 0.01 nanometer to 10 nanometer. So very small wavelength. What is the meaning of 0.01 nanometer? It means that 0.1 angstrom, less than one angstrom. So what is the meaning of one angstrom, few angstrom? We are talking about the atomic radius. The radius of the atom is around few angstrom, okay? Two angstrom, 2.5 angstrom for many atoms. So it means that X-rays can interact with the atoms, okay? So you can investigate the atoms with X-rays, with that property, they have very small wavelength. And if you have small wavelength, then you will have huge energy, right? So if you put that lambda here, or if you put that lambda here, Planck constant is constant, velocity of light is constant, then the X-ray energies will be varied between 120 electron volt to 120 kilo electron volt. So very broad energy range. And especially the energies in that range are very dangerous. So we will talk about this. Do you have any question here in that part? Okay, now let me continue with the X-ray tube. This is the most common method to produce X-rays. And the general design has been used since Röntgen, okay? So what we have here, First of all, we have an anode material. I will go into detail. And we have a cathode material. This is positively charged. This is negatively charged. And we have high voltage in between. In addition to that, the design of the cathode is like this. And we have also a voltage difference between these two parts of the cathode material. And what we have here, we have water in and water out system. In addition to that, here we have a glass envelope, okay? You can consider that this is a vacuum chamber, nothing inside, okay? So we have a vacuum within the glass envelope and then you produce x-rays. So what is the mechanism? Let me go step by step. If you have any question, please let me know during my explanation. So cathode material is also called as hot filament because it is very hot to produce electrons. The main duty of this cathode is to produce electrons. So how to produce electrons? So you apply high voltage to the hot filament, to the cathode, and then you free the electrons, let's say outer shell electrons of the material here, you transfer energy to the outer shell electron. And if this energy is higher than the binding energies, you have free electrons. But this cathode is very hot, it can melt. So in order to prevent this cathode material from melting, you have to choose a correct material. So generally, tungsten, Another name is Wolfram. This is the symbol W used here because tungsten has very huge melting temperature. As much as I remember, it is higher than 3000 degrees Celsius. Okay, you can check in internet or you can check in the books. It has very huge melting temperature. So you produce electrons by applying voltage to the cathode hot filament, and then we have electrons. So if you apply high voltage between anode and cathode by using a high voltage source, we are talking about kilovolt range, you can compare with the household electricity. At home, 
we have 220 volt in Turkey, right? 220 volt. Here we are talking about kilovolt, not one kilovolt. It is around 30 kilovolt or 40 kilovolt, something like this. Very dangerous, very high voltage. Under the high voltage, these electrons are accelerated from cathode to anode material. Why? Because cathode is negatively charged due to the high voltage source, and then electrons are negatively charged, okay? And then they repel each other, and electrons go everywhere from cathode material. But since here we have positively charged anode material, okay? These electrons, negatively charged electrons, are attracted by the anode material and they run from cathode to anode with very, very high velocities, okay? And then they produce X-rays. So I will go into detail. Let me also talk about the anode material. This is usually chosen from copper, molybdenum, or cobalt from such metals. The main reason is that they have characteristic wavelengths around field angstrom, okay? I will go into detail. For example, for the copper, characteristic X-ray wavelength is around 2.54 angstrom for the copper, okay? So it is very close to the atomic distances in the materials. For this reason, this metals, this type of materials are chosen as an anode material. Since these electrons are very energetic, and since they are stopped here by the anode, this anode becomes very hot. So some part of the energies of this electron converted to anode as a heat, okay? And if you do not cool anode material, it can melt. So then in order to cool, that anode material, we use water, okay? We use water cooling system, or you can say chiller. So then you have anode material with some constant temperature under that conditions. So why we need glass envelope here? You see, let me choose laser pointer again. Why we use glass envelope here? Jam, zarf, jam, cup gibi düşünebilirsiniz. Completely closed. No air can enter into the glass envelope and no one can go out except x-rays. So why we need vacuum conditions within that x-ray tube? Because if we would have any air within that tube, these electrons would collide with the gas atoms in the air, and then they will lose the energies before they reach to the anode material. So this is an unwanted situation for us. So for this reason, we have vacuum conditions within the X-ray tubes. You know, X-rays can transmit from even very thick materials, of course, depending on the absorption coefficients. So X-rays are going like this from the anode material, and then you can use them for your purpose, for medical application, for industrial application, for scientific application. Whenever you produce X-rays, you can use them. So how to produce X-rays here? I will go into a little bit detail here. There are two main mechanisms and there are two types of X-rays here within that X-ray beam. One is characteristic radiation discovered by Barkla and the other one is continuous spectrum. So what is characteristic radiation? What is continuous spectrum? So let me start with the continuous spectrum. Continuous spectrum looks like this one. But what is the reason and why we observe such a spectrum? So let me start with the continuous spectrum. This is the wavelength of the X-rays in angstrom, and this is the X-ray intensity. Do you know what is the meaning of intensity? Intensity means number of photons. 
number of x-rays produced, okay? So continuous spectrum means that you have many different wavelengths within the spectrum. Look at this one. If you apply five kilovolt between anode and cathode material here, five kilovolt, okay? Then we have this type of spectrum. What do you see here? We have X-rays in that wavelength, in that wavelength, in that wavelength, in that wavelength. So we have many different wavelengths. For this reason, it looks like a continuous. Actually, there are many discrete wavelengths here, but we see it like continuous. If we apply five kilovolt between anode and cathode material, if you increase the voltage between the cathode and, and anode to the 10 kilovolt, so what do you see? The number of the X-rays are increased and we have much broader continuous spectrum compared to the 5 kilovolt condition. If you further increase the high voltage between anode and cathode, we have many X-rays, more X-rays compared to the 10 kilovolt, and we have broader continuous spectrum. If you increase the voltage here between anode and cathode, so what happens? Electrons are accelerated more, right? Because we will have more electrical field between cathode and anode, and there will be more force on electrons acting to move them from cathode to anode material. And then we have here broader spectrum and more intensity. If you further increase up to 25 kilovolt, 30 kilovolt, 35 kilovolt, in addition to the continuous spectrum, we see another type of feature here, sharp peaks. Okay, here we have one sharp peak, here we have smaller one. So what are these sharp peaks? These are the characteristic radiation discovered by Barclay. This is the K-alpha radiation. This is the K-beta radiation, for example, for copper, let's say. So what do you see here? Here we have X-rays in different wavelengths, okay? Many X-rays with different number of X-rays and energies or wavelengths. But here we have more X-rays, number of X-rays are huge, and we have more a single wavelength. You see, single wavelength. We call it as monochromatic comes from the meaning of the words. Mono means in Turkish tech, chroma comes from the color, and color means wavelength, related to the wavelength, okay? You can say, single wavelength X-rays, okay? This very huge number. You have many X-rays, but they have single wavelength, and they are very, very useful for scientific and technological applications. So compared to the continuous spectrum, this part is preferred, okay? Characteristic radiation is preferred, and in addition to that, this characteristic radiation you can understand from the name, characteristic for each element, for each atom. Each atom has its own K-alpha radiation, K-beta radiation, and also other radiations from other energy levels in the atom. So how to produce continuous radiation? Why continuous radiation is produced? And what is the reason for the characteristic radiation? Now I will try to explain these two topics. Do you have any question here? It's clear here. You may okay. continue. Okay. Now let me explain the characteristic radiation. So why we have here K alpha? Why here we have K beta? What is the meaning of K alpha, K beta? It is explained here. Let me draw. Here you see energy levels in copper. Okay. Let me draw it like this. This is the nucleus of the copper. This is the K shell. This is the L shell. This is the M shell and electrons here. Just schematic representation according to the Bohr atomic model. Okay, so there are also many other electrons. Here, if you take this part, 
like this. If you just concentrate on that region and then if you magnify it, you can get that picture. This is the K shell. This is the L shell. This is the M shell. Of course, we have many electrons in L and M shell and within the same energy level, we can have only two electrons with different spins according to the Pauli exclusion principle. For this reason, L shell must be split and then M shell uh, must be split into the subshells. Okay, you have learned all the things in quantum mechanics and also in atomic and molecular physics. I will not go into detail in that part. So what do you see? At the beginning, you had an electron here and then another electron came with some certain energy and then its energy was enough to excite or free that electron, then there will be an empty state here. I accelerated electron here and this is very energetic and I bombard these atoms within that anode material with these accelerated electrons. And electron comes with very high energy and if this energy is enough or higher than the binding energy of binding energy more or less 9 kilovolt for the K shell of the copper if the incoming photon energy is much higher than this binding energy then this electron here become free and then here we have an empty state so since this level has minimum energy compared to the other levels. Here, maybe you have confused. If you go far from the nucleus, the energy goes down, but this is the binding energy, okay? En tells us the energy levels of the shells within the atom, and we know this information from the quantum mechanics, okay? Energy of the orbit is increasing when you go from the nucleus to the outer shells. This is the quantum mechanical representation. But binding energy is something else. It is related to the somehow Coulomb interaction. Okay, so let me open this transparency again. Here we have positively charged nucleus and negatively charged electron and distance between the negative and positive charges uh, is much smaller compared to the outer shells. For this reason, binding energy is much higher here. Okay, it is completely different from the EN energies. So binding energy for the K shell is the biggest and then it goes down because electrons are far from the nucleus in outer shells. So now we have binding energy in order to remove one electron from this inner K shell, you have to fight against this binding energy. And if this electron has more or enough energy to overcome this binding energy, this electron will be free and you will have an empty state here. Then electrons from outer shells will drop here, okay? Because this place has minimum energy. This electron here in that level strongly attracted by the nucleus, okay, due to the clump interaction. So then electrons would like to go here. They can, they can come from the L shell or they can come from the M shell. So if they are coming from the L shell, it is called as K alpha, like here, K alpha. If they are coming from the M shell, it is called as K beta, I mean the name of the radiation. So electron drops from this level to the K shell and then emits an X-ray, a radiation. Electron drops from M shell to the K shell and emits X-ray, electromagnetic radiation. Okay, and they are characteristic because energy difference is very well known and uh, specific for each element. So this is the wavelength of the K alpha radiation for the copper. It is also written 1.54 angstrom.
here in nanometer, you can also write this one in angstrom, 1.39 angstrom. Why wavelength is different? Because look at this one. If this drops from this level to this level, the energy difference given by delta E, and if this electron drops from M shell to K shell, energy difference is different. So since the energy difference delta E is different, then wavelength of each X-ray is different depending on the transition from M shell or L shell. So usually we carry out experiments with this K alpha because what do you see here? The intensity is much higher compared to the K beta. And of course it is more or less monochromatic. Actually, it is not perfectly monochromatic here you see K alpha 1, K alpha 2. So from the L shell, the electrons can come from L3 or L2 energy levels. So 2P3 half, 2P1 half. So they have different delta E values, different wavelengths, but they are very close to each other. So look at the binding energy of this level here, 933, 953 electron volt. Okay, so the difference is very small. So you cannot separate it. Actually, in reality, it looks like this. Here, how to show the different wavelengths, K alpha 1 and K alpha 2 in that spectrum. In reality, spectrum is like this. Which one has lower energy? This has lower energy. Then it will be higher wavelength. You can consider like this. This is K alpha 1, and somewhere here there is alpha 2. You can say K alpha 1 here, K alpha 2 here. Okay, but since their energies and wavelength are very close to each other, we see it like single wavelength. Okay, but in, in some specific experiments, it matters you have to even filter this one in order to get monochromatic X-ray. Do you have any question in that part related to the characteristic X-ray? Any question? No, clear. Okay, so now let me continue with the continuous radiation or continuous spectrum. In the characteristic radiation, we see just single wavelength. This is the wavelength scale here. We have just more or less single wavelength we have X-rays, we have many X-rays. This is the number of X-rays. And we, we have many X-rays, but they have same energies, more or less single wavelength, monochromatic wavelength, okay? But in case of continuous radiation, what we have here, we have X-ray here with that wavelength. We have here X-ray with that wavelength. You see, we have many X-rays with different wavelengths within the continuous spectrum or within the continuous radiation. So all these areas are also filled with many X-rays with different wavelengths. I hope it is clear. So this is the continuous spectrum. So why this continuous radiation is produced? It is explained by the Bremsstrahlung. This is German term. Brems comes from breaking. Strahlung comes from the radiation, okay? In Turkish, Frenleme Radyasyonu. Maybe you remember from your undergraduate courses. So here, accelerated electrons are coming from the cathode and they are accelerated to the anode material, okay? Very huge energies. And when they are entering into the anode material, they are passing close to the atoms of the anode material and this is the nucleus of the anode atoms okay this is the accelerated electron from the cathode and this is negatively charged nucleus is positively charged and then its trajectory is deflected due to that positively charged nucleus okay so with that moment electron is decelerated so here electron has lower energy compared to the initial case. So again, there is a delta E. Delta E. Now E1 is bigger compared to E2, and I have energy. So this energy is emitted as a Bremsstrahlung, Frenleme Radiation in Turkish. Is it clear? Yes. Now, let me explain something else. If 
I apply 5 kilovolt here between anode and cathode material, I have, I have just continuous spectrum. So energy of the accelerated electrons are not enough. So for this reason, we produce less brems strahlung we produce less photon intensity. We have less number of photons. If I further increase the voltage between anode and cathode, I have more photons. I have more number of X-rays within continuous region due to the Bram's strahlung but still we don't have any characteristic radiation. So if you further increase the voltage to the 15 kilovolt, we have more continuous radiation. We have more intensity in continuous radiation, but still we don't have K-alpha. Here we still don't have K-alpha. When you reach 25 kilovolt, 30 kilovolt, or 35 kilovolt from the copper, we get K-alpha radiation or K-beta radiation. So characteristic radiation appears at very high voltages between anode and cathode. The mechanism is simple. The reason is very simple because when the electrons accelerated from cathode to anode material, they are stopped by the anode. So they lose their energies, okay? And these electrons cannot have enough energies to reach the inner shell of the anode atoms. So in order to reach to the inner shell of the anode atoms, these electrons must be accelerated to the very high energies by using very high voltage. So at high voltages, these accelerated electrons have enough energies and they can enter into the atoms and they can excite the inner shell, K-shell electrons. And then they can produce characteristic radiation. So this is the main reason why K-alpha and K-beta characteristic radiation only appears at very high voltages between anode and cathode material. I hope it is clear. I just have a question about when we increase the voltage, we just increase the intensity of the X-rays or also the numbers and the amount of the X-rays? Actually, the intensity of X-rays means that number of the X-rays. I mean, roughly, if you are talking about the intensity, we are talking about the number of the X-rays per unit time, per unit area. It has such kind of a unit. Uh, I will go into detail later. If you increase the voltage between the cathode and anode, then you increase the intensity. It means that you increase the number of the X-rays. Okay, but in addition to the number of the X-rays, when you increase the voltage between cathode and anode, you produce much broader continuous spectrum. Okay, so if you further increase the voltage, in addition to the continuous radiation, in addition to the increase in the intensity, you produce characteristic X-rays. And characteristic X-rays we have single wavelength, more or less single wavelength, and we have huge intensity compared to the continuous radiation. Is it to answer your question? Yes, I got it. Thank you. Okay, never mind. So now let me continue with the safety measures. This is very important. If you are dealing with X-rays, you must be very careful because an X-ray device or X-rays can cause very severe harms for the people. So the first one, electric shock, because we are using high voltage. We are talking about kilovolt range. As I told you that at home, we are using 220 volt. Here, not 1,000 volt, not 2,000 volt. We are talking about 20,000 volts. We are talking about 20 kilovolts. So it is huge voltage, and there is a risk for the electric shock. The second important damage is radiation damage. So it has many three effects. It can produce burn. I mean, if you are exposed to the X-rays with very high intensity, with very high dose, then it can burn your body or radiation disease can be produced within the body. I mean, one of the organs can lose its function. Okay, so you have to believe with that disease for your life. 
And X-rays, since they are ionizing radiation, can produce mutation in Guinness. So you must be very careful. So how to save the users and other people from the harmful effects of that X-rays? So it can be controlled or reduced by two ways. First of all, X-ray devices must be designed in proper way, okay? So against high voltage and radiation, users must be protected, okay? It is very important. And you can see such signs for the X-ray rooms in hospitals and also at the universities in research centers. This is controlled radiation area. If you see that sign, it means that there is an ionizing radiation inside and no unauthorized entry, also one of the signs in that region. In addition to that, users must be educated concerning the harmful effects of the X-rays and how to use the device and which things are important when dealing with X-ray machines. And education is not enough. You must be careful every time. So this is very important, especially in synchrotron radiation sources at Bessie in Berlin, at DAISY in Hamburg, for example, in Germany. I have worked at these two synchrotron light sources in the past. You have to take courses before you enter into the experimental area. So online courses, it is 10 minutes or 20 minutes, something like this. At the end of the course, you have a test. So this is the safety course. So and in addition to these courses, you have to repeat these courses for each six months, something like this, okay, because you can forget. And education is not enough. You must be very careful in each time. But nowadays, we have very nice, very controlled areas, very safe areas for the users. For example, here you can see an X-ray diffraction instrument from the panalytical and here there is an X-ray tube, X-ray detector and goniometer. And here there are power supplies and water cooling system. You cannot open one of these windows, okay? These windows or doors are locked during the experiment. You cannot open this window. If you open it, your experiment is stopped automatically, okay? And all this material is made from the lead. Okay, lead is very important material for absorbing X-rays up to a special thickness. You can easily absorb the X-rays. In addition, here you see a glass window. You can look inside, you can see and observe your experiment, but X-rays cannot go out because this glass contains lead. Okay, or you can say leaded glasses are used to observe the experiments. So here you see a huge hutch or lead cage, we can say. Doors and walls are made from lead, okay? There is a huge experimental station inside of this cage or hutch. And then you enter, you prepare your experiment. And when you finish your job, you close the door and then you start your experiment from outside, okay? Computers and tables are located outside of this hutch and then you continue your experiment. So if someone accidentally opens these doors, then your experiment is stopped. Even the radiation is coming from the beam line is stopped. Okay, so there are this type of safety regulations and issues when you are dealing with X-rays. So now let me finish with the applications of the X-rays. So this was the first medical application, Röntgen imaging, just after discovery of X-rays in 1895. Medical imaging started in 1896, as I told you in the first transparencies. So then we use them now for medical imaging by using X-ray computer tomography, another Nobel Prize winner discovery. So there is a tomography machine everywhere in the hospitals we use these machines. So another application, X-ray computer tomography for industrial applications. So you produce a complicated metal or plastic material, for example, for the motors, for the planes, for the important technologies. And after the production, you would like to check the cracks inside these parts. 
So X-ray computed tomography is very nice tool without damaging the material, without damaging the part, you can see what is happening inside. X-ray astronomy is also widely used. We get the pictures of the planets, we get the pictures of galaxies, we get the pictures of the stars by using X-ray detectors in space. Another important application is examination of historical paintings. For example, there is very expensive historical painting from very famous painter, let's say, okay, few million dollars. And then you would like to buy it, but you are not sure that it is original or not. So by using X-ray fluorescence method, you know whether it is original or not. I will talk about during the last lecture of this semester. Another important application in archaeology, again by using X-ray fluorescence, for example, here, there is an archaeological part from ancient Egypt, let's say, okay, and you would like to investigate which materials are used within that archaeological material. Here you can see element-specific zinc, manganese, iron, and titanium images of that archaeological parts. So this type of investigations give us very nice information about the history and also archaeology very first application of x-rays and many Nobel Prize winner application is that analysis of the crystal structure. So we have cubic, hexagonal, tetragonal, and many other crystal families and also unicells, okay? You can investigate your material, you can calculate and you can determine your lattice parameters you can determine lattice distortions, you can determine the lattice expansion, many parameters related to the crystal structure and atomic structure you can get by using X-rays, X-ray diffraction, X-ray reflectivity, extended X-ray absorption fine structure are very useful methods to study atomic structure and crystal structures. In addition to that, by using X-rays, we can investigate magnetic properties. Magnetic properties are very important because we use magnetic materials everywhere. Magnets in our daily life, in industry, and also hard disk drives, we use magnetic materials. So here you see magnetic domains, element-specific images of the magnetic domains can be taken by using X-rays. So I will not go into detail. I will talk about all these details in separate lectures, okay? So this is also the topic of the last lecture of this semester. I will talk about X-ray magnetic circular dichroism, X-ray resonant magnetic scattering, and also photoelectron emission microscopy, another X-ray based method in the synchrotron radiation light sources. X-rays are also used for the production of integrated circuits. And here I have a representative image, so you, you can see that there is an integrated circuit here. There are many ways, so by using the X-ray lithography, you can produce such PCBs or integrated circuits by using X-rays in very fast and cheap manner. And also we use X-rays in airports, in customs, and also in shopping centers for security purposes. So you put your luggage into the X-ray machine and the technician can see what is inside, okay? It happens in airports, in customs, even in customs. For example, a truck, huge truck, can enter into the X-ray machine and technicians can investigate what it is carrying. So this is very important also for security purposes and customs. So now let me finish with the content of my lecture content of this course during that semester. Next week, I will talk about production of X-rays. We have discussed the X-ray tube today. We will continue with rotating on a tube, cyclotron, synchrotron, free electron lasers. We will discuss more or less all the details of that methods. And then we will investigate X-ray matter interaction. So what happens if X-ray interact with the atoms, with the matter, we will discuss the scattering and absorption mechanisms. We will discuss the transmission, also the parameters which affect these mechanisms within the X-ray matter interaction.
And the next, we will see X-ray detectors or X-ray counters. There are many different detectors, gas ionization chambers, semiconducting detectors, and also photographic film, very old one used for medical imaging and also CCD cameras. There are many different X-ray detectors. We will see the basic principles of these methods, and we will see X-ray diffraction, X-ray reflectivity, X-ray absorption spectroscopy methods in order to use them structural analysis. We will also see X-ray magnetic circular dichroism, X-ray resonant magnetic scattering methods in order to characterize the magnetic properties of the materials. And finally, I will finish that semester with the imaging by using X-rays. So we will discuss medical imaging by using Röntgen and computer tomography. We will discuss industrial application of computer tomography. We will talk about X-ray fluorescence for archeological and also historical painting applications. And we will finish with X-ray photoelectron emission microscopy for magnetic domain imaging. So with that transparency, I finished my lecture. Any question? No, sir. Thanks for the lecture. Then see you next week. Take mm -hmm. care of yourself. Bye-bye.